All right. Uh, during the break, Tyler was sharing with me an error that he got that was really confusing because the error message didn't happen until he ran. And the error message didn't say much of anything that I understood. So we went through and started commenting stuff out. And it turns out he had an invalid choice here for the simple list item. And he somehow got into, this is the one I want to go back to because that was the one that um, Karen talked about. But somehow he got into a drop-down version here. One of these drop-down ones, I don't even remember which one it was. But he got to one of the drop-down ones, and when he ran the program, at that point, as soon as it hit it, it said, I don't have a drop-down, I don't have anything I can drop down. And it choked on it and it crashed, and the error message was really kind of funky. So is this one you were talking about, Karen? Yes? Yes. Okay. So I can use one of those and a quick test again. So if you're getting errors, particularly ones that you can't debug, I suppose we could have debugged that. If we put a breakpoint somewhere inside that function, we would have seen a crash on that line. But while he was playing around with it, I saw that it wasn't anything I recognized. Again, that's an advantage I have. I know what these are supposed to say. You will, too, after a little bit of practice. There's your red. There's my red. That's probably, you're right, that's probably where that's coming from. So if you don't like that red, remember that third color that was in the color scheme? If you wanted this to be a light gray as well, I'm sure that, and I'm sure the checkboxes were pink. That's your uh, ad text. And this looks like it's also got pink. So yeah, let's go change that and see if he's right. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to use an even lighter shade of red. So I'm going to use A's. And give it a quick run to see if everything turns back into nice um, non-breast cancer awareness colors. Yep. I would have thought they'd been even lighter than that. So. This could go to a C or maybe even a D to make it just a very subtle shading. But unfortunately, any change you make here also makes a change on that line underneath. So that's something to consider because the two are linked together. Okay. So what's next? The next thing to take a look at is refreshing the list view. And let me show you why we might want to do this. Let's go into our button. And we know that it's linked because we've already tested that. So I'm going to take the toast message out. If you want it as a sample, just comment it out. But in here, what I want to do, I'm going to add a new name. So I'm going to say students, come on, dot add, book. So when I click on the button, it should add my name to the list. But it's not gonna. Okay, it should be there. I don't see it. There's Matt down at the bottom. Where would it add it? should add it to the end, right? unless I tell it otherwise, and I didn't, so it should add it to the end. But it didn't add it, but remember what I just did. I added it to the array list. In between the array list and the list view is that darn array adapter. And the array adapter does not know, it does not automatically watch that array list and go, oh, oh, something's changed. Change doesn't happen. So we have to tell it that something has changed and that's where this command comes in ADT that's my adapter dot notify data set changed 
So the data set that it's based on has changed. So then the array adapter goes out and basically refreshes itself. And down here I said, as an alternative, you could just do this set adapter command again. It would restart it all over again. I think this one's a little more efficient. So after I add Volker, then I can do ADT or adapter dot notify. So whenever the data changes and you want it to display on the screen, you have to tell the adapter to go take a new look at the data source, the array list, and update the list view appropriately. This is the old one. Yep. Now, again, I don't see any change, but I expect it to appear at the bottom. And there I am. So, this is a very important part that people tend to forget. You make fancy changes, you add new stuff, and nothing happens. And don't forget, I gave somebody some grief about this in your assignment a long time ago. But you can tell it to add it at position zero. And we don't have to scroll so darn much all the time. But now if I run it and add it, and again, when I run it, this starts all over again. The fact that I added Volker to the array was just temporary while the program was running. As soon as the program ended or I start a new version of it, it starts all over again, fresh. So here's the proof. No Volker. Add it, but this time I put it right at the top, which makes it real easy for me to see. Questions about notified data set changed. Okay. Then the next thing we want to do is sense when an item is clicked. And again, we're going to need an on item click listener. So that's a little bit different, thank goodness, because if it was an on-click listener, then we'd have to start writing code saying, uh oh, it's, and so on. Okay. But before we do, I, I just noticed I didn't go far enough here. Let's code the button to take whatever's in the text view. Instead of adding Volker, let's take whatever's in the text view, and that shouldn't add a whole lot of complexity here. So before this, we want to get what's in the text view. But first, I'm going to check to see if the text view, now I'm going to define a string, we'll call it new name. And that's going to be equal to my text view, converting my text, my input to a text view. So my input was TV ad. No, edit text. Now, all of that said, turn this, everything in the parentheses now is an edit text. I want to get its text. And remember, when you get text, it could be fancy fonts and stuff, so we have to two-string it. So this is a quick way to say, go into that edit text, get whatever it is, and stuff it into new name. Could be empty, somebody accidentally clicked on the button. So what I want to do first is make sure that it's not. If the new name is empty, no. If it's not empty, curly bracket, then all this other stuff, the end curly bracket goes below it. If it's not empty, if it is empty, I just ignore it. I could throw up a toast saying, hey, give me something. I'm just going to ignore it. Otherwise, I'm going to add whatever's in the string. And finally, I 
wipe it out so I can start another one. So this should allow me to very quickly add items to the list. And there's nothing really new here. Most of this you did in the validation program, lab five or three or whichever one that was. Getting text, adding to an element, to a list view, all of that we've done before. So we're just doing it in a different circumstance here. And this is the one part that's new, so let's give that a quick test. Now I know why that keyboard's popping up all the time. I don't think I've turned my keyboard on my em in my emulator. So I'm going to have to type it here using the on-screen keyboard, which is painful, but I'll live with it for now. There's Bob. be adding as we go. Why they're underlined, I'm not sure. I don't know if all of you discovered this yet, but I can go into my emulator, my AVD, that's my emulator manager. Now I might not be able to do this with it running. But I'm already getting annoyed having to use the on-screen keyboard to type characters. So I'm going to go into the AVD manager, and here's my one, and I want to edit that. Go to the advanced settings and look for the keyboard. If you do that, two things happen. First of all, and this may be a side effect that you don't like, but while I'm talking about it, let me finish it and relaunch the emulator. The side effect of that is that the on-screen keyboard never comes up now. It's expecting you to use the physical keyboard on your device. So if you wanted to see, like in your loan program, that yes, the numeric keyboard is actually the one that's popping up, you'd have to turn this back off again if you're into that mode. But here for my testing, it's getting more annoying than anything else to have to keep using that keyboard, getting it out of the way. That's part of the process. But realistically, when somebody starts using this app, that's what's going to happen. Is they're going to see that keyboard pop up right away. All right, the emulator is running again, so now what we should see when it comes up is no keyboard, no on-screen keyboard. But I can type in here and then click the button. So if you still have a keyboard popping up, at least for development purposes, I would turn it off. But again, the other side of it is once you're done developing, then turn that back off, turn the keyboard back off again so that you can see how the app really behaves live. And that also works when you've got an actual device connected. I know Zach runs a lot with a device connected. It still doesn't bring up the keyboard. It expects you to use the keyboard on your device instead of the act or on your computer instead of the one on your device. All right, the next thing that's going to come in handy somewhere down the road is sensing when an item is clicked, and this is where I left off about 10 minutes ago. We're going to need a listener. I recommend that you create this listener like you do every other one. So here is my, I need to link widgets. Where would link widgets go? There it is. And so I'm going to create an on-item listener for this. A 
but make sure you're looking for an on item click listener, not an on click listener. Otherwise, anywhere inside the entire list clicking will cause this to occur. And it may not be a whole lot different, but this at least picks the item and you can mess with it. Once again, I'm going to assign to this. I'm going to use the red light bulb to say make this main activity listen, and I have to then implement that. Move it up so I can see it better. There's my on click listener. Now, notice the click listener would have different pieces of information. The on click listener includes four parameters that give you information about what's just happened. The first one is the parent, it's really the adapter view, which in our case is the list view. Notice it's been assigned a more generic type though, so if you ever do want to use this, you'll have to typecast it to a list view first. So this is the list view itself. This is a bit misconstrued construed because it says the view, but what this has in it is the actual text of the row. You can change these names, but you can't change a type, but if I wanted to call it the row or if I wanted to call it the text, I can change it. And, but most of the examples you see online do not change this. And by the way, in this version of, Visual, of uh, Android Studio, these names are much better than they were the last time I taught this class. One of these was V1 and V2, and you couldn't tell what the heck they were. They had really goofy names. The other thing that's interesting, I think, is the position that tells you the index where you are which row number. So this position is where am I within the entire list. Even if there's 100,000 of them, there's only 10 on the screen. This will still tell you where are you within the 100,000, not within the 10. The ID, every time I tested this, keeps giving me the same answer as position, so I can't tell the difference. If you look online at the definition of these, that didn't help me much either. So I don't use the ID at this stage. If you need to know which list view was it, maybe you got multiple list views. Again, think a tablet. You can ask. This is the text. So inside here, let's put in a toast. So every time we click on a row, we can see the information that we've collected. Now let's start with the view. And concatenate the view, and then concatenate a comma, and the position is, and concatenate the position. Don't forget your long text. I wonder, I doubt it, if I went command shift return, nah, it's not that smart to show. So I'm just concatenating in all the information I want to see, at least to start with. I want to see what's in the view, and I want to see what's in the position, just to verify that the, first of all, that this, this on-click listener is functioning, and also to see what kind of information it's giving back to me. Okay, the add thing will still work, and it might not be a bad idea to add. I'm going to add Volker in here. And now when I start clicking on stuff, Reen, when we started, was in position one. Position one, zero, one. Okay, he was in position one. So let's verify, is this position zero or is it position one? Oh, that's not real good. I think we had to do, did I read that right? I have to do a get text. Let me check here real quick. We might have to do the get text out of that view. View. Get text and convert it to a string. Ouch. Okay. Get text. No. Let me 
Let's check that. Ew. Look at how complicated that got. We've got to turn it into a text view, then get its text, and then convert it. Yuck. All right, so I'm going to create another variable just like I did in my notes. Call the string SEL for selected, and that's equal to probably a couple parentheses, text view of view, get it, turn it into a string. That wasn't quite as convenient as I hoped it would be. And then here I can just put in select. So unfortunately this view is a view. We don't know what kind of view it is. Remember a view is anything. It could be a relative layout view. It could be a checkbox. It could be anything. We have to say, no, 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 no. I know it's a text view. Convert it. Give me the text that's in it, just like you do any other good text view. And turn that into, and then use that throughout. So this is pretty common for me. And you can almost steal that, right? In any of your on I don't click listeners, you could steal that code because you're going to be doing it over and over and over again if you want to know the text that was selected. I'm getting an error from somewhere. Good, it went away. Let's try that one more time. Hope my message box is a little cleaner this time. I still want to add myself to the beginning. Zach was in position zero. Notice the program knows that I'm in position zero and the view is over. Zach is now in position one. So when you add, it automatically updates things. I'm still in multi-select mode, but notice whenever I click on one, it just like the list view in Visual Studio, it only remembers the last one. So the position comes in handy and the view comes in handy. I believe in my notes I talked a little bit about other ways that we can get information. Need to convert it. We did that. You can also get the text by using the first parameter. Now, this is a little bit of a lie. I don't like it. I, should, I thought I changed that. I guess not. Missed that one. This is using the list view itself. Now, the list view is a class level variable. So I could ask that, hey, list view, what do you have at position, position? And notice that doesn't have to be, it has to be converted to a string, but it doesn't have to be converted to a text view according to this. But what if I wanted to get a little more, well, let's call it professional and say use the parent instead. Remember the parent is a generic adapter, it's not a list view, so the first thing we would have to do is define a list view, so that's what I'm going to do, list view LV, that is equal to a convert the list view of the parent. So this says, hey, trust me, I know, it's a list view, I made it. Convert it to a list view. And then underneath here, I could redefine select is equal to list view dot get position. Was it get? I forgot. Get item at position. Position. Convert it into a string. just an alternative way of doing it, obviously a little bit longer. And so now select has this value instead of that value. They're both basically the same. And we can display it. We should get the same answer. And before I do anything else, I'm going to convert this back into a single select. I changed the format, but I didn't change the list itself.
Same answer. So that's a couple of ways that you can get the text. But there's one more. Remember that if we do our job right, and we notify whenever we change the data, my array list and my list view should be in sync, right? Doesn't happen automatically, because they are side by side with that array adapter in between. But my array list should have the same information in it. So underneath here, I'm now going to replace select one more time. And why am I using select over and over again? I'll show you three different ways. I can go into my list of students dot get position. So I don't have to use the array list. And my notes say this might actually be a little more efficient. Because we're going into our memory saying, give me what's in there. Instead of going out to the list view, finding the element in a certain position and sucking that out. Might be a little more efficient. Still works. So let me put a comment in here. I'm just going to put all these lines next to each other. Now, I'm going to put this in the recording, and you're going to be hunting for it in the future, I think. So write yourself a little note somewhere, tattoo it on your wrist or something, that it was in recording number 2, 7.2, a time about 27 minutes. What if my array list was an array full of loans or an array full of students? And I don't just have your name, but I have your program, and I have your GPA, and I have your address and your phone numbers all stuffed into a student record. And I put that into the array list. What would you use for the array adapter? Two string. You'd have to override two string so that whenever you took the student record and tried to stuff it into a list view, you have a two string that controls what displays. That ought to sound familiar like programming logic intermediate. It's exactly the same way it works in the list box there. But then what happens if you want to get the GPA of the student that just got clicked on? Is this going to work? No. Because this tells you the text of the view, the row. Is this going to work? No. What's in the list box, what's in the list view is nothing but text. Nothing but text. It's not an object. This, however, would work because the original array list at position Karen, whatever that would be, I can go in there and then I can say, give me the or the dot get GPA of that and get the magic number out of it. So this is all well and good when you've got an array list of strings, but when you start getting into array list of objects of classes, this is the most handy technique for getting the data out of it because it gives you the entire object. And then you can pull out whatever fields you want to do with. Or for that matter, you probably have to calculate or GPA. Probably a method in there that does that. Once you know where she is in the list, then you can ask the method to do the calculation. So this is maybe the best. It is definitely the most flexible because it handles objects, not just text, which is what we're playing with today. But all three of those, for our purposes right now, work really well. Questions about that? It's 
very quiet, so let's keep plugging along. According to this, if you wanted to change something, we could use set text on it. Now, I'm not sure how valuable this is. Because if I set text, uh, you know what, I'm going to skip it. It's here in case you need it. But if I set text of this text view row, I've changed what's in the list view. Sorry, the list view has been over here all this time, I think, wherever it is. Here's the list view. But what happened to my original array list? Nothing. Those two are never connected. Your responsibility, programmers, to sync them. If you change the array list, then you can use the notify command to say update my list view. This says update the list view. And that's why I misspelled Brittany's name to fix it. I don't think we need to do that. I don't think this is real great. Better off changing the array list and then notifying the array adapter that it needs to update. It's a better way to do it. Should get that out of there. Okay. Here's your lab, by the way. It's coming up. Don't let me forget to talk about it. It'll be due in a couple of weeks, so you'll have some time. My advice, don't wait too long. Two weeks from now, you forgot half the stuff I just lectured on. If you do it right away, you might be okay. The stuff in the book, that's pretty straightforward. This one you're going to have to think about a little bit, I hope. What if I want to know which in a multi-select list are, or whether an item is checked? So if we have multiple ones, we might want to know, are you checked, are you checked? And if we might want to, for some reason, manually click certain ones. Okay, in order to test that, I first have to go back and make this into my context view, make this a multi-choice. And I think I'm also going to change the simple list back to multiple. Because it's activated is okay, but we're going to be checking to see if it's checked, and it's highlighted as the same thing as checked. It might be a little easier to understand if we actually see checkboxes. So I'm going to pull this out again, and remember, all this is is a format, and I want the list item multiple choice. So in your spare time, that I'm sure you have lots of, you might try some of these different formats to see how things look. Let's just go with that. And just a quick check to see that it worked. You can sit back. Mine works. Yours should too. Okay. Pretty boring and great, but at least now you know how to change it. So that seems to be working. So now how can we check those things? Pretty simple. But we have to get to that parent, that list view. The row itself can't tell you if it's checked, unfortunately. If it can, that's news to me. Let me know. Okay. We need to ask that row if it's checked. So here's the is checked, here's the set checked. So let's start with the is, let's do the set checked first. So I'm going to, just as an example here, I'm going to, just as an example, when I click on an item, I'm going to also select the one underneath it just as a demonstration of how you can use code to check items in the list. I already have my list, my, I've already converted my parent to a list view. That's necessary. Got to have that. In my notes, I called it P instead of LV for parent. But really, it's the list view. The list view that got sent in, so that if I have multiple list views, I can tell them apart. So here, I want to say the list view dot... I've been talking too much, didn't even pay attention. Set item checked.
two parameters. First one is the position, where? The one where I at plus one, just as a demo. Because the one I just clicked on, it's already checked, right? And then, what do you want to set it to? You want to check it or you want to uncheck it? So you can do both here. Just say true or false. True, we'll check it. And I didn't even type that right. Don't do plus plus here because remember plus plus says add one to it after the command is done, which is a little late. So I'm just going to do plus one. Keep in the back of your mind, I think a couple of you got caught by this, that plus plus actually changes the memory location's value. It's not what I want to do here. I just want to reference the next one as a demo. So now every time I click one, it should click the next one automatically for me, by definition, by you have code. Update. You update it to this view. Nope. I don't think so. Because I'm just telling it to check it. I'm not updating its data. But his, his theory was, well, if I don't do the update command to the tap to the adapter, I'm not working with the array here at all. The only time you need to worry about the update command is when you change the contents of the array by adding something, by editing what's inside the array, by deleting something. Then you need to update the array adapter. Right. But here I'm not doing that. Here I'm saying pick green and click, it automatically gives me the next one. And then come down here, click, it automatically gives me the next one. What happens if I click this one again? It turns it off, but it turns the next one on. Right? Now why would you do this? You wouldn't. It's just a demo to show how you use the set item check command. So when you're writing your program, I'll be putting plus one in there. That doesn't mean it's just my demo here. The key here is set item checked. Which one do you want to check? Well, how would you, why would you check it in code? I don't know. It's something you have to think about. And we can flip the system around here and say if it's checked. If lv dot get is it get or is no it is is item checked in position oh let's pick a number seven again just for demo what do I want to do toast Just as an example. Who's in seven? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So Kevin is, is Kevin checked? Nothing happens. Okay. But now if I go John. Kevin goes along with him, and 7 is checked, and then it tells me the information about John. Every time I check something else, it says 7 is checked. No, it's quiet. Now, given that information, here's what I want you to do. As a lab, that will be due two weeks from... When my labs do Sundays, a week from Sunday, programs are due Friday, labs are due Sundays. This Sunday you have chapter 30 due. Next Sunday, I would like you to do this lab. In a multi-select list like this, I want you to toast which ones are displayed by name or which ones are checked. So if I were to run this right now, this toast, it would tell me that Brittany, Karen, Nathan, Tyler, John, and Sam, assuming there's none hiding underneath here anywhere, are checked. Okay. You can do it on a button or every time you click on one, you could toast and say, here's what's like in a multi-select list. And I'm going to uncomment this thing here just so it doesn't confuse you. I'm going to comment it out. 
You understand what I want the lab to do? You can use this. I will save this if you have. Excuse me. If you have your own, you can use this. But for those of you who aren't here in class, I'm going to put this on OneDrive. It's called List View Sample. Go get a copy from OneDrive and modify it so that whenever I click on an item, that's when I recommend you do it. Whenever I click on an item, you give me a list of every single object that's selected by name. I don't want to see position one and three and seven and nine. No, I want to see the names. Clear? Okay. 